Hi there, we are Julian and Marie, and I'm going to show you in a little bit more detail how we use the tunnel technique to form the dresses we make. Marie's going to show you. Here we have two patterns. One is a front and one is a back, and they've been made from these vest-like structures. Um, these little, the back neck, the back vest and the front vest are made by slightly raising the neck on this pattern and also then extending and growing on kimono sleeves. So what we have left are a back and a front with grown on kimono sleeves. They're cut bias. Uh, when we actually construct them but when we um, when we lay them on the fabric we put the necks facing together so we position them a little bit like this now there can be different variations on different grain lines but that's the essential important thing that when you're positioning your patterns your necks must face or be in a similar direction to each other never opposite so next up, we're going to then take the fabrics that we've been using and um, lay this on and cut our first hole. So Marie has a, a tube that she's made and she's made it by piecing together uh, sort of offcuts of uh, an Ankara wax cotton, two versions, and it has a front and it has a back and it creates like a duvet shape. So it's been sewn down its long edges, or what are called its cell edges, with a very uh, deep seam allowance. And then uh, it's been sewn off at the ends down here, so that that end is closed. And then down the other end is where the hem is. And that's where our feet are gonna come out of. And imagine it like a duvet, you need an opening to get into, so that's its first opening, or indeed its first hole. So it starts with a hole. And that's what we begin from. So by laying this out, we're then able to take our patterns, our fronts and our backs, and position them. There's many different ways in which you can position it according to your cloth, according to what colours you want on the front and what you want on the back. We tend to use bias grain lines, um, or not true biases always, but off grain lines, um, to create a little bit more flow in the uh, fronts and backs. But it takes a little while sometimes to find the right positioning. But each each choice you make, each little movement and adjustment, will uh, result in a different dress. So it takes a little bit of time just to figure it out. So this is the positioning we've decided on. So now Marie is going to mark around the front part of it, and that is the neck, the shoulder, down to the side seam, but not the bottom part of the pattern. We like to use a sharpie, particularly on this kind of cloth, which is very patterned and has a lot of intense detail. So we stop at the bottom. We don't mark along this edge down here. It's important. If you mark that in, then you're going to end up with a line on your garment that you don't need. And if you've done it in a sharpie, then that's a bit of a disaster. Unless you're going to make it into some sort of design detail. So try to avoid doing that. Just mark the top part of the pattern only. Imagine that the pattern continues onwards. So that there is no line here. This is just a shaper pattern. Often when we make patterns, we assume that we have to either cut all the way around it or draw all the way around it. But this is just a shaper pattern for the very top part. So we stop this point here. So that's the front done. Now the back. This pattern includes seam allowances. It's got a centimetre seam allowance on the shoulders and side seams. It's got a 0.5 seam allowance on the neck and this pattern is going to be lined. And in fact this pattern we're using is in fact the lining pattern. It actually extends longer. 
and we use different lining patterns according to different, we use the same pattern at the moment for different dresses we're making, but as they are at the end come out at different lengths, we use the same pattern folded back to certain lengths to uh, finish it off at the very end so that it becomes fully lined. So our lining pattern and our um, outer shell pattern are the same, apart from we make a few little reductions to, by taking off a little bit off um, the sleeves and tying it out of the neck, then we make that pattern, that lining pattern fold inwards and not be seen from the outside. So again, when you're marking around it, you mark only until the bottom of the arm in a pattern like this. If it's a dress like shape, it would be the same. But we don't mark along here. It's not necessary. So now these patterns can be removed. And as you can see, as it's very, you know, busy print, lots going on, um, it would be quite hard to see if you couldn't see you know, if we weren't using something like a Sharpie. So we've put the uh, patterns just back again to show you how we now link the side seams. And the side seams are this bit from underneath the arm here, this is the back, neck, shoulder, end of your sleeve. Uh, that's The length of this sleeve is probably to about just, a, a, just above the sort of uh, uh, elbow line. And um, so that's here. So this bit here is the side seam. And what we then do is we just, Using the curve of your wrist, we just kind of like curve around and continue this. And this is a freehand line. There's no tools involved. So it's what you feel, okay? And then that, that line's gonna continue, but it's gonna join to its pair on the other side. So this is the uh, right side seam, going from underneath the arm and it's continuing And then the two will eventually just join up together so that they it goes from underneath the arm around over to underneath the other arm so that's the right side seam and they're looping together it creates a looping side seam and the same is going to happen on the other side on the left side so this is the left front and we continue around. This one's cutting over a seam, cutting over a seam again. And on this side, it's gonna go slightly over onto the other side of the fabric. So if it's not wide enough, you can continue onto the other side of the fabric slightly. In fact, it's good to try and think of this tube as not really having a side necessarily, because it's tubular, it can rotate around the body 360 degrees. So we now have a joined up seam that goes from underneath the arm on the front around in a big swoop, cutting over the seam that's here from the, uh, when we were sewing the fabrics together. So we actually cut this line, we'll put a pin in here just to reinforce it. And over here, so it cuts over this line, continues all the way along goes onto the other side of the fabric for a moment, although it's actually the same side. And then cutting over the seam, so we'll put a pin in here too. And every time you cut over a seam, just make sure you put a pin in it. And then it continues back around, joining into the left back. And that's the side seam. So now we're going to cut along those seams. So now we've cut all around the very first hole and we're going to subtract or remove it. So this first piece that's removed is the very first subtraction. Although it's hard to see with this particular fabric. This here is the front neck. We have here the back neck.
So next up, because this is currently right side of the fabric facing out, so the seams inwards, so we're now going to turn it inside out because it's easy to pin and sew it. And then after that, we're going to join the shoulders together. So now it's been turned through the hole we just cut, so it's now inside out, seams facing out. It's much easier to, to pin it together this way. If you want to mark it inside out from the start, you can. Um, we tend to put it together with the good side facing out so we can just check it all looks good and then mark it on that side. But um, if you want to mark it with the um, wrong side facing out, so it's inside out, it means that any of your marks or any of your um, pen lines won't show up when they're cut because they'll be internal. So now we're going to find the shoulder seams of the back and the shoulder seams of the front and they're going to come together. So here they are. And first of all we match them. And they're going to be sewn with a one centimetre seam allowance. This particular pattern is cut in such a way so that um, it can go over the head without needing a fastening. Just hold that back up against yourself a moment. So we have a front which is predominantly magenta in colour with this little sort of snake-like pattern on it. And then the back is this rather lovely swirling, also snaky-like pattern. And they're going to get pinned together and sewn. So then after this, we're going to join the side seams. So the side seams are a loop. So if you were able to show both ends of the loop, um, so it's, this one is quite a long loop. And so that these two are going to come together from underneath the arm, where the, from there, and it's going to sew around in a little curve and then it'll go into a straight line. And we're going to pin that first, always pin it. Now these two curves, because they've been, the first part of it is driving the pattern, so there'll be some relationship between the two curves, but then the rest of the curve is drawn by hand, and so they won't be identical. Uh, but by the floppiness and the flexibility of the material, in fact, it's cut on the bias, they'll slowly uh, be able to be bent and walked together. And so there'll always be a halfway point in this loop where uh, the, um, you know, you'll reach an end where the exact halfway point of the loop is. And it pins all the way to the end. You can put in pleats as well. This is what Marie's doing now. Ad lib, these are not measured pleats, these are um, kind of just pleats that you feel kind of uh, work well with the design that we're making. We try, we, you know, we do things intuitively sometimes. So this is a very long um, looping seam. So um, it could just be long and straight, um, but by being long, it also has the ability to potentially be pleated. So here from the end of the sleeve, it's just being pinned around all the way to where it loops back. This is the point at which it loops back again, the looping seam. And there were some pleats added in just here. One centimetre seam allowance all the way. And when you cross over any seams that's, like in this example, because it's pieced together with different fabrics, we're gonna have to reinforce these areas. Now Marie's gonna just pin the other side and then we're gonna sew it.
So here's the other side that's been sewn from underneath where the sleeve ends, down the side seam to the point at which it loops back, the looping point. And this one also has a few pleats put into it. So next up, we're gonna sew it together. So this is the side seams and the shoulders closed. We press the, the shoulder seams and also the very top of the um, side seam, but not the full side seam. Next up, um, Marie is going to have a look at it in the mirror. Now, although I'm talking through this video and um, telling you, the viewer, how we're making things, those instructions are for you, not for Marie. So how Marie works is different to how I work and it might be different to how you work because we all need to sort of like have a little look at the garment and figure it out. Marie figures it out in accordance to her own body. I tend to work on garments that are hollow that are not for my body. And so I'm not really putting myself in relation to it quite as often as Marie might. But what Marie's really trying to do here is trying to figure out where the first holes might go. And so that's a sort of a design decision. Because this is a very long garment, the next thing is that we create a series of holes that connect together. Um, here's a pattern for it now. This is a circular hole and the dimensions around it, all the way around, are equal to the circumference of Marie's hip. So you take a hip measurement, not a tight hip measurement, but an easy hip measurement, so it has ease in it, it has some looseness in it. And you then construct a circle. Um, I'll do a little demo of constructing the circle. So I'm gonna start with a square of paper. Now the size of this paper is larger than the width of your hips, quite considerably larger, just big enough to work in. And now Marie is going to take a easy measurement of her hips using the tape measure. So make sure you go over the bum, the widest part. And rather than being a tight measurement, we're gonna go nice and easy. And we're just gonna hold the tape measure at this point here, the number, the amount, at this point there. Okay, so now I'm taking this length and I'm folding it in half. That's half of the circumference of Marie's hips. This is a quarter when you fold it one more time. And then if you fold it one more time, it becomes one eighth. So this is a calculation, but you don't need to do it numerically. All you've done is you've taken the circumference around the hip. There's an easy measurement. You've divided it, the tape measure in half, half and half. That creates eighths. And if you were to count the layers of tape there, there'd be eight of them. But you don't need to know the number, you just hold it in your hand. You then take the square of paper and you fold it in half, exactly. Score the line, then take the folded edges together and that will make quarters. Score the line. Then you take the folded edges together once more to make a point towards yourself. Now, if you were to count the number of pages here, layers of paper, you'd find that there are eight of them also. If you put the V towards yourself and you take this little measurement towards the V, on a, rather than putting it tight, put it on a slight curve 
and then bring it towards yourself, it will fit in exactly here and here. Make a little mark where it fits in. Fits in at that point. When you're measuring, some people measure from here. That would be if you're me measuring radiuses or diameters. We're not measuring the, the radius or diameters across the circle. We're measuring the circumference around it or its perimeter. With this little mark, you can, if you wish, keep equidistant from this point to create your circle. But you can also make your own measure by just simply transferring the line to the other side and using it as a guide to follow. As long as there are 90 degrees here and here, it will be a circle rather than a flower shape or some sort of strange hexagon. Cut it out. Now this is the pattern for a hole for Marie to easily uh, move through, but it's not a pattern yet until we've added important things to it to help make it. So we're gonna have notches. We're gonna have a notch on each quarter. So we're gonna put a notch here, 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 and here. And one of them's gonna be a double notch. And I always put some sort of star or marking to remind me that that one is different. So double notch, single notch, single notch, single notch. Got, I'm using very thin paper so that it's bled through to the other side. But if it hadn't, make sure it's a double-sided pattern. You'll see why in a minute. Now, when you look at this circular pattern, it looks quite small because a circle doesn't have the ability to stretch when it's in paper. In fabric, it might stretch a little, but it doesn't look very large. Marie actually fits well within this circle, so it looks very minute. But what you have to think of is that we're not actually creating circles here, we're creating holes. So this bit that's left over here is the hole pattern from which this circle came out of. If you consider this circle has the ability to stretch much wider considerably wider, almost one and a half times the diameter of this circle. So a hole always has an ability to stretch, to be larger, to have more room within it. So if Marie was walking down the street and she were to see a circle this big, a hole this big, she'd need to avoid it because she'd, she'd fall straight through it all the way. So now Marie is going to locate two matching pairs of holes. And those two holes have a relationship with each other. They're gonna actually be joined and sewn together. And when you cut two circles, two holes, and you join them, it creates a route through the fabric, a route that I call a tunnel. That's why this particular technique we're teaching you is called tunnel technique. So now Marie is just trying to figure out where she's gonna put things. I'm not giving her any instructions. She's done this lots and lots of times. She does it in her own way. But I'll maybe just give you a little bit of dialogue on top. So remember that the pattern has a double notch and then on each quarter, a single notch. And when you mark these, when you're gonna mark around, wherever you decided you're gonna put your first hole, then you're gonna mark around it and then mark outwards into the cloth, just a little bit. Remember this has got a centimeter seam allowance, so you wouldn't want to go more than one centimeter then you mark all the way around it. And this positioning really of this hole in relationship to the neck, I say that the bust is somewhere around about here. The waist level is about here. So this is really on the hip, in the hip area. It can be here, it can be higher, it can be lower. We can position it in different places. Every decision you make as to where that first hole goes will make a different kind of dress. My advice to you would be don't go too low in positioning the holes, especially the first ones, and try to stay away from the hem. If you do accidentally go near the hem, or if you haven't got a very long tube, this tube was three meters roughly long. We didn't measure it exactly, but it's about three meters. If you were to go very low near the hem, then you would need to close that hem off. Uh, so that uh, we cut the hem last of all. Okay, so that's the first hole. And the reason this pattern is double-sided 
uh, why it has notches on both sides of it is it's a bit like a pancake. It's going to now flip to its partner. And that's the decision that's going to be made now as to where that second hole might be. So now we're going to join the first hole to its pair and that requires a fold. So what's happened here is this pattern has flipped from here upside down to here. And so the, the double notch is now at the bottom of the garment facing this way whereas when it was flipped the other way it was near the top so remember the pattern is folded over and there's a relationship between the two like a mirroring there's actually a mirror line between these two what i would call a valley fold line because as this one folds across there would be a mirror line between that that creates the symmetry but we're not pressing it like in origami we're keeping the fabric soft and fluid. So this now gets marked around in the same way with the notches, double notch, and then three singular notches, half notch and two quarter notches. And this, these notches are super useful when you come to sew it back together again. So next up, we're going to match the double notches together. Now these fold together a bit like a book closing. So right sides together, that creates the valley fold. So the two circles come together like a book closing. But when you when you start to pin it, you're pinning right sides of the fabric together and you won't be able to pin all the way around the circle because the seam gets forced onto the inside of the dress so that the seams are internal, not external. This is something that you, you'll find with practice. But you'll be able to pin perhaps a, a quarter or maybe halfway around the circle and then you're going to have to go up through the hem to pin the rest of it. And that creates an internal tunnel. So when you, we're not dealing with circles here, we're dealing with negative spaces, with holes. And so when you cut two holes and the two holes join, then when you turn it internally, you'll see a circular space pattern or a circular space shape. But of course it has no structure holding it together. So it collapses and when the body passes through it, it will flow around the body in a soft way. This is it now from the inside and with a one centimetre seam allowance we're going to pin and sew all the way around these two pairs of holes. So these are the circles we've just removed and all these circles we keep because uh, we use them, these little subtractions, in a zero waste way to make what we call puffs. So they'll be made by joining onto triangular pieces, uh, each circle joining to a triangle with another small hole cut into the centre of it. And this creates a little protrusion or a corona like shape that jumps out of the surface of the uh, dress. And we use these for decorative purposes. So now at this point, we have pinned one of the pairs of holes, the first one, the one that's in the front of the dress, but we're now going to create one in the back of the dress too, or maybe it might be a secondary one in the front. It depends on the design, but again, Marie checks it, decides where perhaps it might be best to put it. And it's different for every person, uh, for every tube. But the next decision is where will the secondary hole, pair of holes be placed in the garment. So now the second hole is uh, positioned and 
uh, placed into the back of the dress. In exactly the same way with the front, there's a relationship with the two pairs, they're a mirror of each other. Now the two pairs fold together. So again, this pattern is flipped upside down. So the notches will be opposite each other. There would be a valley fold between here. But of course, because the fabric is undulating and it has little mountains in it, it's an imaginary valley fold line, a symmetry line between the two. So now we're going to join these two circles together. Double notch, double notch, right side to right side. In the same way with the two pairs of holes cut in the front, the seam will end up on the inside of the dress, so you can only pin about a quarter or half of it before having to flip it inside out to continue pinning the rest of the holes. So now we're going to sew these two circles together, the one on the front, uh, the pair on the front, and also the pair on the back. There's four circles cut into this dress so far. Two circular seams, both of which need sewing with a centimeter seam allowance. We're keeping these edges raw in this version because it's gonna be fully lined. So we've just sealed the hem off um, and that's brought the uh, bit of the back onto the front of the dress. So at the moment, there's no way of actually getting out or into this dress. It's got a neck, it's got sleeve openings, but it doesn't now have a hem opening because we've sealed it closed. And um, this just allows us to sort of position another pair of holes in the front that will pull some of that volume upwards. And these are all just decisions you can make when you experiment. You don't have to seal the hem off. Um, but in our instance, we decided that we would. So it will require another pair of holes to be cut into the front. So here we have the front of the dress and uh, we're gonna position a pair of holes, uh, an extra pair of holes into the front. But for this one, instead of using the circular pattern that is the dimension of Marie's hips, because she's not gonna actually travel through these holes, we're using a smaller pattern. So we're actually drawing around a bowl. Uh, you can use plates, saucers, bowls, often quite useful things to draw around, cups. Uh, this one's got a nice size, not too small. And as long as you keep a symmetry between the two, so there's a relationship between the two holes, then um, they won't twist. You can, if you want, twist the pattern, if you want to twist the holes together, but it creates a little bit of irregularity, um, but it's worth exploring. But these two pairs of holes will now join together and be sewn. And that will make one smaller pair and one larger pair in the front. One of the larger pair, Marie will pass through. Her body will actually move through these holes. This is something that's quite strange when you're on the outside of the dress to imagine, but these pairs of holes you're creating, which are forced inwardly, become inward spaces that the body passes through. It's kind of like a tunnel. If you imagine inside a cave or a catacomb that you're actually moving through. But these very small ones, your body won't be passing through.
So with these circles here that we make, these are the subtracted circles, we use them afterwards. Once they've been subtracted, they're then added back in again. Uh, we match them with some triangles. The distance around the circle is equal to the triangle. It's then got a smaller hole cut into it. They're then sewn together to make these kind of little structures like this. And then these little structures, these little corona-like shapes get placed into the garments in different parts. And uh, with smaller holes cut into it where they join. And they make little sort of de decorative extrusions. Okay, so now, because the hem has been brought upwards, and it's been sealed, and a new hole has been cut to pull that backwards, the back of it, up onto the front, then we need to cut a new hem, because there's no hem on this currently, so I'm just going to find the lowest point on this particular dress and make a few markings. Now we're going to create lining on this pattern and the lining will pull some of the outside of the dress onto the inside and make quite a soft hem. But first of all, we need an opening so that we can get our legs in. It needs to be wide enough to step to me. It needs to be wide enough to put a stride through, so I'll extend it a little bit. Maybe come in on this one. I'm going to have a little curve here, almost like a tear shape. And I'm going to have it on this side too. Two little teardrops. I'd never cut a slash for a hem because it would leave the end point prone to uh, getting caught or tearing or ripping. So I try to keep curves all the time. Um, I think it's very important for wear and tear but also just creating a nice, uh, more fluid looking garment. So now we have a way, a way of getting inside the garment again, through the different tunnels that are internally in here. So next up, we'll line this. Uh, well, we'll add some puffs first, make sure it's good, photograph it, and then we will line it fully finished with a internal lining going through the different tunnels inside. 